Today's video, video number three, is about Descartes' rejection of naive realism, or direct realism, i.e. we're talking about the first meditation. So I'm assuming that most of you will have read at least some of Descartes' meditations in a previous course, so you probably already know that Descartes has two major focuses in the meditations. He establishes that, God, that he exists and that God exists. This is what he means when he says his two central topics are God and the soul. I mentioned in the last video that we are not interested in his arguments about God in this course. Here we're focusing on the soul part, or what he calls the soul. We're not really talking about the soul in the Christian sense of an everlasting soul in heaven. Uh, and neither is Descartes. By soul, Descartes is referring to the mind. As I'll emphasize today, the meditations has a fundamentally epistemological argument. Descartes is investigating the foundations of human knowledge. But there's also a false philosophy of mind component to that. Descartes' project has him investigating the basic components of philosophy of mind, perception, imagination, reason, ideas, etc. Note, though, that Descartes, uh, Descartes is well known for his theory of mind-body dualism. That particular argument is incredibly important for contemporary philosophy of mind, but it's not part of our investigation into theories of perception. And so I won't be talking about mind-body dualism at all, either in this lecture or in my future lectures on Descartes. I mentioned in the last video that Descartes is an important figure in the early modern scientific revolution. The meditations, no matter how we may think of it today, was very much a scientific endeavor. What Descartes is concerned with is not just God and the soul, but in arguing that these can and should be studied by the scientific method, meaning that they should be taken out of the realm of religion and theology and brought into the realm of science. Descartes was a mathematician as well as a philosopher. That means that he had a great respect for demonstrative proofs and logical reasoning. Math has the benefit of being grounded in fundamental axioms. It has a basis of irrefutable truths, formulas that can be demonstrated to be solid, and these form the basis of more complex mathematical theories. This is a kind of rigor that he wants to bring to the study of God and the soul i.e. the mind. You see that in one of the opening paragraphs uh, of his letter to the Sorbonne. He says, I have always thought that two topics, namely God and the soul, are prime examples of subjects where demonstrative proofs ought to be given with the aid of philosophy rather than theology. This is probably familiar to you. Descartes' central method his way of finding the demonstrative proofs for his philosophical investigation, is called methodological doubt. That means that he eliminates anything that is possibly subject to doubt in order to find an axiomatic foundation in something that is logically and demonstratively solid. It's a reductive strategy. The method is meant to clear away all faulty assumptions so that what is left can be counted on, allowing him to rebuild out from there. Again, this is probably familiar to you from your previous experience with Descartes and other courses. So I'm, I won't be emphasizing his axiomatic formula, I think, therefore I am, especially not today. Today I want to analyze with you the purpose and result of that methodological doubt as it applies to Descartes' theory of perception. We know that Descartes says that his central concerns are God and the soul, but I'm going to be uh, following Harry Frankfurt's lead in emphasizing that there is a larger and more central concern guiding the meditations. It comes down to one main and overarching question. How do we attain certainty? 
Today's lecture is largely in keeping with the secondary reading I've assigned for this week's reading and reading quiz. Frankfurt makes the case, one that I agree with, that Descartes' meditations are best understood as a quest for epistemic certainty, meaning Descartes wants to know what it is that forms the basis of our knowledge about ourselves, about God, and about the world. This is how Frankfurt articulates Descartes' main guiding question. Assuming that I am a reasonable man, how, if at all, can I attain certainty? This is evident in Descartes' own description of the purpose of his methodological doubt. He says, Anything which admits of the slightest doubt, I will set aside just as if I had found it to be wholly false, and I will proceed in a way, in this way, until I recognize something certain, or if nothing else, until I at least recognize for certain that there is no certainty. As I said before, Descartes was a scientist in his day. And as I discussed in the last video, questions about perception are of great scientific importance, especially after Descartes' treaties. Unlike in the medieval period, the thinkers that are emerging in the scientific revolution see the individual human as a source for knowledge about the world. This is a time when thinkers are using investigative and demonstrative methods to make observations about the natural world and then applying their theories to make predictions about the natural world. Suddenly, divine revelation is not enough. Humans are applying their knowledge and experience to make judgments about how the world works. So it now becomes a pressing matter to understand what it is that gives us such an ability. Do we, as individual humans making observations, really have access to that kind of knowledge? Are our limited human capacities capable of this task? That question is echoed in Descartes' willingness to conclude that perhaps there is no certainty. So if certainty is possible, how is it possible? What kind of proofs, rules of evidence do we use? And more deeply, what kind of mental faculties are involved in giving our judgments certainty? How can a scientist slash philosopher like himself and others who seek to know about the world rid themselves of false beliefs? Which of our beliefs, judgments, understandings are really true? We see this concern in the opening sentences of the meditation. This is Descartes. Some years ago, I was struck by how many false things I had believed, and by how doubtful was the structure of my beliefs that I had based on them. I realized that if I wanted to establish anything in the sciences, that was stable and likely to last, I needed, just once in my life, to demolish everything completely and start again from the foundations. The project is to, on the one hand, rid us and himself of superstition, of false beliefs, and on the other, to establish a stable foundation for scientific knowledge, for the establishment of lasting true beliefs about the natural world, and of scientific knowledge. So certainty is a key pursuit. Certainty means true knowledge that is solid and lasting. It's not subject to doubt. His pursuit of this certainty is systematic. He wants to know what the mental faculty is that is responsible for certainty. What is it in the soul, i.e. the mind, that could allow for certainty? if such a thing is possible for us at all. So he looks at three possible sources for, of certainty. The first is sense perception. The second is imagination. And the third is reason. And he'll test each one of these three until he comes to the one that he thinks is truly the ground of certainty. The answer, by the way, is going to be reason, but we'll get to that next week. 
Today we are following Descartes' lead. Sorry, sorry, Descartes' lead. Meditation one doesn't just dismiss option one, sense perception. It's a sh it's a short meditation, but each sentence is packed with more than you might have gotten from your previous exposure to it. As I'll emphasize in this video, the first meditation is a very careful consideration of why sense perception cannot be the foundation of certainty. In making that argument, Descartes ends up making a coherent and extremely influential case against direct realism. So in ridding himself of all previous assumptions, Descartes tries to channel the most common sense, most immediate possibility for how we might attain certainty about the world. This is the first option, the option that says that the, sense, that the physical senses are always reliable. This is how Frankfurt puts it. This is the principle that amounts to the claim that whatever is sensed exists as it appears to the senses. In other words, what in the last video I was calling direct realism. So see that, see that video, video number two, for more detail. But in short, direct realism makes this exact kind of claim, that our senses unproblematically put us in direct contact with the world as it actually is. Here's the proposal. We arrive at certainty about the world through sense perception. Our senses put us in direct touch with the world as it actually is. The biggest problem with this proposal is that it crumbles very easily with methodological doubt. If the rules of methodological doubt require rejecting whatever can be doubted, then the senses do not pass the test. Here's a nice uh, cinematic illustration of this concern. Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. <laughs> You're particular for a ghost. Who are you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you sit down? I can. We'll do it then. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your own senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them, a slight disorder of the stomach. <laughs> you might be a bit of bad beef, a blot of mustard, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Humbug, I tell you, humbug! That was Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. In a nutshell, Charles Dickens illustrates for us Descartes' primary argument against sense perception as a foundation for certainty. The problem is that the senses are not great at reliably telling us what is real from what is not real. Just like Scrooge, we can't always trust them. Descartes points to this very problem. He says, whatever I have up till now accepted as most true, I have acquired either from the senses or through the senses. But from time to time, I have found that the senses deceive and it's prudent never to trust completely those who have deceived us even once. 
Descartes is often misunderstood here. Does this mean that Descartes is saying that sense perception is never reliable? No. That's not his point. Some philosophers have taken him to be making that claim, that he is completely throwing the senses out the window. But that's not quite right. If we keep in mind that Descartes' project is to find the source of absolute certainty, then we realize that sense perception cannot be that source, not as the main pillar anyway. His point is that when we are asking ourselves, as Scrooge did, whether what we are experiencing is real or not, it doesn't seem to be sensation alone that can help us, just as Scrooge observed. Why? Because sometimes we take the imagination to be sensation. From our subjective view, it occasionally happens that imagination is indistinguishable from sensation. We can dream or hallucinate that something is there. Are you 100% certain that your eyes are not playing tricks on you? Are you 100% certain that everything you've thought you've seen or felt was really there? Descartes again. As I think more carefully, I see plainly that there are never any sure signs by means of which being awake can be distinguished from being asleep. Descartes' point is that if you are certain, it isn't sensation alone that is giving you that certainty. We'll see next class that he thinks that in order to get that kind of certainty, you need to make use of reason. Descartes argues that the senses on their own can't reliably tell the difference between what is real and what is imagined. But again, Descartes does, uh, doesn't just say that, uh, sorry, <laughs> Descartes doesn't just say that uh, as if it is a kind of opinion. He makes a carefully reasoned argument for why sense perception is not the foundation of certainty. I'll follow Frankfurt's lead here to break down the steps of Descartes' argumentative system. We noted this above. Descartes is trying to rid himself of prejudice. That means not getting ahead of himself and not dismissing possibilities until they prove logically unsustainable. This is how Frankfurt puts it. Descartes' examination of the senses leading to the dream argument is in fact dialectical. He considers a principle, criticizes it, proposes a revision to cope with the criticism, probes the weaknesses of the revised principle, and so on. The principles Descartes is interested in have to do with the rules of evidence, and understanding Descartes' use of this dialectical method is easier when you remember this. So this is his question. What kinds of rules of evidence, i.e. what kind of demonstrative proofs, do each of these three possibilities give us in our quest for justified belief and knowledge? The first meditation is asking what kinds of evidence, how solid of evidence, do each of these three options, sense, perception, imagination, and reason, give us when we try to form a judgment about what we know for certain. Frankfurt makes the case in chapter 4 that Descartes is running through possible statements that could ground a direct realist's, i.e. sense perception based, rule of evidence for certainty. Descartes gives three articulations of the direct realist position, each one aiming to correct a problem in the last. So here we're going to run through three articulations of the direct realist proposal. As I noted above, what Descartes is doing, uh, at least on Frankfurt's account, is proposing one option as a rule of evidence for certainty, finding a problem in it, proposing a better articulation, and then seeing if the new version works any better. So this is possibility number one. Sense perception invariably involves the presentation of an independent physical object whose character is just what it seems to be. 
Remember, this is about rules of evidence. What this first articulation is effectively saying is that the rule of evidence for what something is, uh, for what something is definitely like, is just what our senses tell us what that thing is, or what that thing is like. But there's a problem here. Sometimes our senses are not reliable. It might be foggy. The object could be far away or very small. In these cases, the senses do not tell us exactly what something is like. The word invariably is false. Here's Descartes. The senses occasionally deceive us with respect to objects which are very small or in the distance. Descartes doesn't actually spend very much time on this first articulation. If you blink, you'll miss it. He doesn't seem to think it's a very serious possibility. But the second articulation is a bit more plausible and he spends a little bit more time on it. This one says that the senses are trustworthy whenever they operate under ideal and external conditions. So the thinking is, what if we remove the kinds of external conditions that interfere with the census' success in identifying objects? So as a rule of evidence, we specify that it only applies under ideal external conditions, i.e. whenever there is no external circumstances like fog or size or distance causing us to mistrust them. But there's still a problem. The senses can still make a mistake, even in the most ideal external conditions. A clear sunny day, no noise, the object neither too far nor too small to observe. What if the person is myopic or delusional? In other words, ideal external conditions isn't sufficient. Here's what Descartes says. How could it be denied that these hands or this whole body are mine, unless, perhaps, I were to liken myself to madmen whose brains are so deranged or so damaged that they firmly maintain they are kings? So here we get to the, the final articulation, the one he spends the most time on. What if the rules of evidence specifies that not only do the external conditions have to be ideal, but also the internal conditions as well. Obviously, we don't expect someone who's blind or myopic to have a perfect idea of what something looks like. Also, we can acknowledge that what Descartes calls madmen are not candidates for our, our ideal rational observer. We'll just rule those out. We're not talking about madmen, we're talking about scientists. So in this formulation, the proposal is Whatever is perceived under ideal external conditions by an internally qualified perceiver has certainty. But here's his response to that. A brilliant piece of reasoning, as if I were not a man who sleeps at night and regularly has all the same experiences while asleep as madmen do when awake. So here's the issue. And it's why Descartes spends much more time on the dream argument than the other two. There's still a problem. This is the crux. Dreaming is a normal human activity. Even brilliant, perfectly rational scientists do it. A dreamer, i.e. essentially all of us, can be deceived into... Uh, can be deceived by our own minds into thinking that thinking something that is not there is real. So adding internally qualified perceiver still doesn't get us to certainty either. Conclusion, sense perception is not in itself sufficient for certainty. In our hunt for what gives us certainty about knowledge of the world, sense perception isn't it, at least not on its own. Note, though, as we said above, Descartes should not be understood as saying that sense perception is useless. Another mistake people make in reading Descartes is that he's saying that the external world isn't there. In fact, 
As we'll talk about in a few minutes, dreaming actually suggests that an external world must exist in some form that we can access via sense perception. What he's shown is that Scrooge is right. The evidence from the senses alone can't tell him whether the ghost of Jacob Marley is really there or not. There's nothing in the senses all by themselves that can clearly demarcate what is real from what is imaginary. It is always at least possible that we are dreaming or hallucinating. But even with that possibility that we are dreaming or hallucinating, there is still grounds for hope. Descartes recognizes that your dreams and hallucinations must have some connection to reality, to something you experienced at least once, if not right now. Here's how Frankfurt puts it. First, the theory of imagination that Descartes formulates immediately after the dream argument presupposes that we have some veridical experience, which provides us with the materials out of which the fantasies of dreams can be constructed. This suggests strongly that the dream argument is to be understood as undermining confidence in our ability to discriminate between veridical and non-veridical perception and not as raising the possibility that all perception is non-veridical. In other words, as I said above, it has to do with the means by which we achieve certainty that something is actually there and is as we think it is. It's about rules of evidence. But that isn't the same as saying that sense perception plays no role in giving us access to what is real. Descartes doesn't think that sense perception is always wrong, it's just that it is sometimes wrong, and so, for that reason, it isn't a solid foundation for achieving certainty. So does this provide us a basis for, for certainty, a kind of back door to certainty from sensation? In other words, can the imagination be, in a certain sense, a kind of certainty? Again, I'll follow Frankfurt's lead in arguing that, just like he did with direct, the direct realist proposal for certainty from the senses, Descartes runs through three articulations for how imagination might actually suggest some kind of certainty for sense perception after all. Here's the overarching proposal for how the imagination might give us a kind of certainty. Perhaps we can say that we can be certain about some things about the world because we can imagine it. First possibility for, the, for this proposal. The imagination is closely related to the world as it actually is. What we imagine is a model of the world as it actually is. This may not tell us whether what we see right now is really there, but it perhaps does tell us what we have seen at some point. Here's Descartes' words. Nonetheless, it must surely be admitted that the visions which come in sleep are like paintings, which must have, must have been fashioned in the likeness of things that are real. Take the example of a house. Could you dream of a house if you had never had any direct experience with an actually existing house? If you think about it, the answer to that question could well be yes. Is it really the case that everything we imagine, hallucinate, or dream is a full replica of objects that we've seen? Not necessarily. We can dream up things like mermaids and griffins and orcs and the elf kingdom without seeing exact models of them. Model must be wrong. So model was too strong, but still the raw materials must come from reality. Mermaids, griffins, and orcs are not entirely foreign to us. They're mostly a mishmash of parts of things we've seen. Descartes agrees. He says, for even when painters try to create sirens and satyrs with the most extraordinary bodies, they cannot give them natures which are new in all respects. 
They simply jumble up the limbs of different animals. What the imagination does is combine, reconfigure, add to, or remove detail, but it doesn't seem to create the detail. So Descartes thinks that the most basic building blocks of our mental imagery can't come from within. Or at least he seems to. The question is what these materials are. Are we talking about hands, and wings, and wood, and roofs. You may not have needed to see a house to dream of a house, but you need to have seen shelters, boards, roofs, etc., right? But there's still a problem. Why these objects are features? What makes a wood board different from a house? Couldn't we still be combining features to make a mental conception of a wood board. This suggests that you need to go down more specific, more simple, features that are not compositions, i.e. very basic elements. Here's where we see Descartes mulling this. He says, or if perhaps they manage, that is artists, they manage to think up something so new that nothing remotely similar has ever been seen before, something which is therefore completely fictitious and unreal. At least the colors used in the composition must be real. This is how Frankfurt understands Descartes' thinking. Imaginary things are necessarily composites. The simple cannot be fictitious, but must be real. This one sticks, but it has a limited applicability. It includes only simple and universal things. What are these simple things? Simple things are the most basic components of the physical, i.e. corporeal, world. These are things like extension, shape, quantity, size, and number, presumably also color. Descartes writes, this class appears to include corporeal nature in general and its extension, the shape of extended things, the quantity or size and number of these things, the place in which they may exist, the time through which they may endure, and so on. This is how Frankfurt understands Descartes' thinking. Descartes revises the principle then, so that it recommends accepting beliefs in the reality of the simple and universal elements of which he says sensory objects are formed. There's a whole lot happening behind that thought, thought and a whole lot that is still missing from Descartes' thinking. But that claim about what the imagination can and cannot do gives us a hint as to Descartes' theory of perception. First of all, he does seem to think that the senses put us in touch with a real world, or at least at this stage of the meditations. But so far, Descartes' argument only proves that sense perception puts us in touch with simple and universal things, the ultimate basics of the material world, that things have size or quantity, color, etc. There are, we should note, two ways that we can access the simple and universal. One is by sense perception, and one is by reason. The objects of reason are different, though. The simple universal objects, that is. Descartes makes a very important point that even in a dream, 2 plus 3 equals 5. These are the basic and universal truths of reason, of logic. Descartes writes, For whether I am awake or asleep, two and three added together are five. A square has no more than four sides. It seems impossible that such transparent truths should incur any suspicion of being false. Here we get an important hint to where Descartes will find certainty. Logical and mathematical truths have a stronger and more solid basis, one that not even dreaming can unseat. The evil demon hypothesis is meant to give him a possible way to shake the foundation of reason. But 
as I'll talk about more in the next video, he thinks that not even an evil demon can shake the foundational grounding of logic in at least some cases. Before today, I just want to talk about sense perception because what Descartes writes in just a few paragraphs about the simple and, and universal things reverberates from Locke to Berkeley to Hume to Kant, so it's worth fleshing it out. Descartes thinks that there are, uh, there are basic qualities of, of objects, uh, extension, color, etc., that he seems to be saying can only come from sense perception. He doesn't think that this class of thing, the most basic qualities of objects, can come from the imagination. And they can't come from reason either. They have to come from sense perception. We can surmise that Descartes thinks that we first have to have, have a sensation, i.e. experience, of these simple universals in order to think about them. The irony is that it is the empiricists, Berkeley and Hume, who will be the ones to argue that this can't be entirely right. But we'll get to that. We can surmise, though, that Descartes has found a, a certain, a kind of certainty here. Our knowledge of basic things about objects has to come from the world. And in this, he sounds a lot like other philosophers that we're going to read about this term. Locke especially will make a very similar case. What Descartes calls simple and universal things, Locke will call primary qualities, that he thinks can only come from direct experience of the world. The problem is that Descartes later will argue that all ideas, even these ideas of simple corporeal things, are innate and not from experience. The fact is that he doesn't really explain what he means by simple and universal things or our access to them nor why the argument in the first meditation that acknowledges that these come from sensation should be rejected. Locke, though, will make a strong case against innate ideas and insist that these primary qualities are, in fact, empirical. They come from experience and are not innate. This is Frankfurt. The passage in the first meditation that I am currently considering seems to involve a defect even more egregious than Descartes' failure to elucidate his theory of the imagination and the versions of his principle based upon it. Frankfurt, who is mostly aiming to defend Descartes, doesn't defend him at least very strongly on what is happening with simple and universal ideas. He thinks that we need a lot more information from Descartes on what exactly he's saying about the role of the imagination and sensation in connecting these simple and universal things to our experience of the world. But he does note, Frankfurt does note, that perhaps the reason for Descartes' quick treatment of the simple corporeal ideas and his later turnabout on it has to do with the methodology of the meditations. At this point, Descartes is supposed to be considering only sensory beliefs, and so a more complex story about the root of innate ideas has no place here in the first meditation. Still, though, the holes in Descartes' analysis of perception will be fruitful fodder for the rest of the philosophers will study this term. That's why I've looked at this so closely. These same questions will come up again and again in this course. So, just mentally bookmark these issues for now. We might not learn much about simple and universal things from Descartes, but we definitely will from Locke and Hume. Students tend to be impatient with Descartes, mostly because his argument for the existence of God is especially hard to accept. But I have a lot of respect for Descartes, because he really got this whole conversation about perception rolling. It's Descartes who gets us thinking about sensation, imagination, and reason as the components of both perception and the foundations of knowledge. Descartes' method of doubt proposes an interesting quandary. What are the implications 
of noticing that our senses are sometimes wrong. How much of our knowledge of the world does actually come down to direct sensory access? What role does the imagination play in combining the basic elements of sensation into complex ideas? And this is, in a nutshell, what this course as a whole studies. And so we will be exploring these far more as the course progresses. In the meantime, please read Frankfurt's uh, chapters 4, 5, and 6. I hope that won't prove to be too much reading. The chapters are Chapters are fairly short, and the reading quiz will also help you focus your reading on the key points of each chapter. Also, if you, are, uh, if you haven't read Descartes' Meditations, I do recommend reading the first meditation closely. Even if you have read it before, you may find that you read it with new eyes after this lecture and after reading Frankfurt. It's worth your time. It's a very short meditation. So next time, we'll delve more into the second, third, and fourth meditations and why Descartes argues that reason is more important than sensation and imagination in perception. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'll see you next time.